Merry Christmas and welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve as we celebrate the birth of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Today we'll explore the significance and power we find in the meaning of Emmanuel, God with us. your Bible, please turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. We have been in a series for Christmas entitled The Dividing Line, A Baby Changes Everything. And today we want to look at the meaning of Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 1, I'll begin reading in verse 18. The Scripture says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. Surely she had to be immoral because how does one get pregnant? says in verse 20, But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph... Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. In the Christmas classic, the children's Christmas classic movie, A Charlie Brown Christmas, Charlie Brown is asking and seeking for the true meaning of Christmas. What is Christmas all about? And we have people today asking that same question, wondering uh, that same question. Well, Christmas, is it, is it all about Santa and reindeer and toys? Is it about food and, and feasts and Christmas cookies and pies and sweets. I like what one guy said. Christmas is when the month of December is my cheat day. Uh, Isn't that kind of good? The whole month is my cheat day. What's Christmas all about? Is it about family get-togethers and being together? Jimmy Kimmel said this, Christmas is that time of year when all the family gets together in one place to look at their cell phones. That is Christmas. And uh, so what is Christmas all about? What is the true meaning of Christmas? Well, I contend that the true meaning of Christmas is one prophecy, one Old Testament prophecy, one verse, one name, the name of Emmanuel. And the name Emmanuel, we don't have to wonder what that means. The name Emmanuel, the definition is given to us, Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now, we think about that, Emmanuel. We've been singing about Emmanuel, God with us. And many of us, we, we could answer that on, if we were on Jeopardy, what does Emmanuel mean? We could get that right. But many of us don't see the deeper meaning. What does it mean? Not just what is the name translated, which means God with us, but what does that mean that God is with us? What does it mean at Christmas time that God came to be 
with us. There's an old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. Lots of times in Scripture, we can get really close to things and you miss the big picture. You miss the full meaning of what this Scripture is saying and what does it mean that God is with us. That's what I want to focus on today. You know, the Bible was written so many years ago. New Testament was written in the first century, 1900 years ago. The Old Testament, starting from the time of Moses, Moses lived in the 1500s B.C., So the Old Testament is 3,500 years old. The New Testament is roughly 1,900, 2,000 years old. And people have mocked the Bible and said, oh, the Bible is just an old book. You guys uh, read an old book. You study an old book. You preach an old book. You teach an old book. You need to get with the program because uh, things have changed since the Bible was penned. Here's the thing about the Bible. It is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's book is not old and passe. God's book is as fresh as this morning's newspaper because it's alive. You read other books, but the Bible reads you. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Listen, you remember this. God knows... As you sit here today, as you watch uh, online, on television today, God knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows exactly what you need. And he wants to meet your needs. It's not an accident that you're hearing this message today. It's not an accident that you're here today. God has something special from his word that he wants to share with you. The deeper meaning of Emmanuel. So I want to share today about three wonderful discoveries from the name Emmanuel. What does the name really mean for us. We know uh, what the Scripture says, and we know what it meant to Joseph. What does it mean for us today? Discovery number one, the name Emmanuel means God has addressed our greatest fear. It means that God has addressed our greatest fear. Now, fear is something that all of us deal with. And in this room, we have lots of different fears. And many of us share the same fears, but there are lots of different fears, and and sometimes a fear can really kick into overdrive, and it becomes a phobia. And there are lots of, of fears like that where you're just deathly afraid of things. Some of us have uh, acrophobia. That is the fear of heights. Anybody have the fear of heights? Yeah, I have that one. I don't. I don't like heights. Uh, Acrophobia. Some of us have uh, a phidiophobia. You say, I, I'm not sure if I have that one. Maybe I do. Um, I'm afraid I do. Uh, a phidiophobia is the fear of snakes. Anybody have a fear of snakes? Lots of you have a phidiophobia. Now you know what it's called. Many of us have arachnophobia. That's the fear of spiders. Many of us know what that means because we saw the movie. And uh, so we have arachnophobia. I've kind of have all these so far. Uh, (laughs) Claustrophobia, that's the fear of being in an enclosed space. How about this one, atychophobia. Lots of people have atychophobia, even though they don't know they had atychophobia. It is the fear of failure, the fear of failure. But now I think the greatest fear, and Emmanuel means God came to address our greatest fear. I don't think the greatest fear is fear of failure, fear of heights, fear of snakes. The greatest fear is called isolophobia. It's the fear of being alone. That is man's greatest fear, to be alone. 
You know, there have been some studies done on what happens to the human body when, the human, uh, when a human is in isolation, away from all other people. And the studies show that it, it has a detrimental effect on the human body. Higher blood pressure, vulnerable to infection, more likely to get dementia and Alzheimer's when you are isolated. There was a lady, or is a lady, she's still alive to my knowledge, an American journalist. Her name is Sarah uh, Shord. She was arrested in Iran and accused and convicted of being a spy, and she was put into solitary confinement for 416 days. She said, I began to hallucinate. I began to hear voices. I began to see things. She said, I almost lost my mind. I was isolated and alone. Hey, Emmanuel means God is with us. And God is with us, that speaks to our greatest fear, the fear of being alone. Now, we talk about hell. And we say, uh, you know, what does the Bible say about this terrible, horrible place called hell? Why is hell such a terrible, horrible place? Is it because of the flames? That makes it a terrible place, but that doesn't make it the worst place. Not just the flames, not just the regrets, not just the anger. There's weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth in hell. What makes hell so awful? You're alone. You said no to God. I don't want you in my life. Leave me alone. And what happens? God says, all right, not my will, but yours be done. And you are separated from him forever and ever and ever. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 speaks of those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord comes back, it says, and these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. What is that? Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Forever and ever and ever alone, away from God and all others. Well, God doesn't want that. And so the Lord came. This one called Jesus, he came, and he is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. You know, Isaiah 7, 14, that was a prophecy given to King Ahaz. King Ahaz was king in Jerusalem, king of the nation of Judah. And he had two nations coming against him. The uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, they had aligned with Aram, the Arameans, and they were coming together as a coalition to destroy Jerusalem. And he was very afraid. The Bible says they were shaking like a tree in the wind. And the Lord sent Isaiah the prophet, and Isaiah the prophet came to Ahaz and says, you don't need to fear uh, these two kings who are coming together to destroy you. He said, ask for a sign. And Ahaz says, well, I'm not going to ask for a sign. And Isaiah said, you're trying the patience of God. Listen, you're not asking for a sign. Well, God is going to give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, a, a woman in your kingdom, a, a, a mature woman of, of uh, childbearing age who is a virgin right now, she is going to bear a son. She is going to get married. She is going to get pregnant. She is going to have a son. Her son's going to be named Emmanuel. And before that kid is old enough to know the difference between good and bad, those two kings that you fear, they're going to be gone. You don't need to fear anymore. That was the immediate fulfillment of Isaiah 7:14. But that prophecy also had a fulfillment 730 years later when Jesus came, and Matthew says this is the, the greater fulfillment of Isaiah 7:14. The virgin, not in Ahaz's kingdom, but the virgin Mary, she's going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And she's going to have a son, and they're going to call his name Emmanuel. They never called Jesus Emmanuel. Jesus wasn't called Emmanuel like uh, that was his nickname. Well, we call him Jesus. Sometimes we call him Manuel. If you get real close to him, you can call him Manny. You know, they didn't do that. He, he's not called Emmanuel like that's his name. That's a title. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us, and he's God with us to address our greatest need, and that is the, the, our greatest fear, and that is the fear of being alone. God is with us in the person of Jesus. Now, 
Joseph, he's, he's engaged to Mary. They're not married yet. They're just engaged and an engagement different from today where you get engaged and you can break up. If you got engaged, you had to divorce. If you were not going to follow through on the marriage, you had to get divorced. Now, he had never been with Mary, never had touched Mary in a physical way, in a sexual way, but Mary comes up and she says, Joseph, I'm pregnant, I'm with child, but it's not what you think, it's of the Holy Spirit, and Joseph loved Mary and wanted to believe Mary, but how do you believe that story? How could you possibly believe that? And he, he couldn't believe it. He just said, I want to believe it. I can't believe it, and, and I can't marry you. I'm a righteous person. I can't marry you because you've been unfaithful in our betrothal period, so I'm going to have to put you away. I don't want to disgrace you publicly. I don't want to bring you up in front of the whole town and say, uh, this is Hester Prynne. Put a big scarlet A on our chest. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to put you away secretly, and that's when the Lord sent the angel in Joseph's dream to say, no, 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 this child is from the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus, God with us, he is the son of Mary and the son of God. He is the God-man. Son of Mary, so he's human. Son of God, so he's divine. And the scripture says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. You'll call his name Emmanuel. He will be Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. I told you before a story. I heard it years and years ago. It was a story about two guys who had a Bible study, college guys, had a Bible study in their dormitory, and they just opened it up. Anybody in the dorm could come, and they would teach this Bible study, and people would come, and, and uh, they had some foreign exchange students that were, were there, and they would come, and people that hadn't been exposed to the Bible before, they were coming, and these guys were doing a good job teaching the Bible study. And one day, on a Saturday morning, if I remember correctly, they had this Chinese guy come to their dorm room early on a Saturday morning when most college students are asleep. He came and he knocked on the door, and uh, he, he, you know, woke them up, and they're like, yeah, what, what, what is it? What do you want? He said, hey, I've been coming to the Bible study that you guys do. And he goes, it, it got me to start reading the Bible. And he said, I was reading the Bible today, and I came to the verse in Matthew, the last verse in Matthew, and I read these words, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And I had to come tell you about it. And the guys are like, yeah, that's, that's really good. That's a great verse. Last verse in Matthew is really a great verse. He said, no, I read this. And it said, and lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. And they said, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful promise, a great verse. He said, no, you're, you're not getting it. And I read, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And they said, yes, we know, we get it. He said, no, you don't get it. My name is Lo. Now, if you're reading the Bible, and you've never read it before, and you run across your name and the words, and Jeff, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, and Frank, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, and Mary, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, and Carol Ann, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age, wow! That just blows you away. That's different than it just saying, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hey, you put your name in there. Emmanuel means God has come in the person of Jesus to be with us always. And that means that he's going to be with us in the most difficult times that we'll ever face in life. The Lord says in Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters... I will be with you, and through the rivers they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms in all of the, the, the Bible, 
where David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that is the worst that you can possibly go through, the valley of the shadow of death. Even though I, go, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. My God is with me. I'm reminded of Darlene Dibler, such a great testimony. She was a missionary in Indonesia when World War II broke out. She was uh, arrested, taken over by the Japanese, and put in a concentration camp. And from the concentration camp, she too was accused of being a spy, just like uh, that lady in Iran. And so they took her from the concentration camp, and they put her in a prison camp. And they put her on death row. And every day, she said, they beat me and interrogated me and interrogated me and beat me. She said, I never cried once before my captors. But she said, when I got back to my cell, I cried buckets of tears. And she shares her whole testimony, such a powerful testimony. At the end of her testimony, she says this. She said, brothers and sisters, don't feel bad for me, for what happened to me. She said, because although those times in that prison cell were the worst times of my life, they were the sweetest times of my life because God was so near to me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Hebrews chapter 13, the Lord says this, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. That's what he has said so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? The Lord has said, I will never leave you. In the Greek construction of Hebrews 13, 5, five negatives. The Lord says this, I will not, never, never desert you. I will not, never forsake you. Well, that's bad English, but it's great theology, and God is saying in such strong terms, you can trust me. I will be with you, and I will not fail you, and I will not forsake you. So Emmanuel means God with us, but what does that mean? What's the deeper meaning? What does that say to us today? That says that God has addressed our greatest fear, the fear of being alone. Second discovery Emmanuel means that God has addressed not only our greatest fear, but our greatest need, our greatest need. See, your need, greatest need, my greatest need, our greatest need, Joseph's greatest need, Mary's greatest need, Simeon's greatest need, Anna's greatest need, John the Baptist's greatest need, Elizabeth's greatest need, Zachariah's greatest need, we all have the same greatest need because we all have the same greatest problem, and that greatest problem is sin. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. You say, well, what, what's, what's so bad about that? The wages of sin is death. That's what's so bad about that. We're all sinners, and what happens to sinners? They die. And what happens when you die? It's not just your body dies, it's you're separated from God forever. You're, you're, you experience your greatest fear, and that is isolation and alone, away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. Hey, we are in trouble. And so Emmanuel is here. Jesus came to be with us, and He came to be for us, and He came to die for us. That is the reason that he came, to die for us on the cross. He was born to die. As I told you a week or so ago, when they gave Jesus the gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, gold is the gift of a king, frankincense is the gift of a priest, and myrrh, that aromatic spice that they used in burial, that's the gift for a savior. That's a strange gift to give a baby is myrrh, but they gave it to him. Why? Because it foreshadowed the fact that he was going to die 
for the people. He was born, as the song says, in the shadow of a tree. The shadow of a tree, ever present, was the knowledge he would be hanging on a tree, the tree of Calvary. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why he came. He came to die on the cross for you and for me. So our greatest need is salvation. And the Lord came to be with us so that he could die for us, so that he could save us from our sins. To save us from our sins. You shall call his name Jesus. Jesus Yeshua is the Greek form of the Hebrew Jehoshua, which is shortened to be Joshua, and that name means Yahweh saves. Call his name Yahweh saves. Jesus, why? Because it is he who will save his people from their sins. That's our greatest need. Without him meeting our greatest need, you know what happens? We experience our greatest fear. To be alone forever and ever and ever, isolated in a terrible, horrible place called hell. But since he came for our greatest need, we can have him with us forever. It's such a great deal. No wonder the angel said, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Christ the Lord. Now, I want to ask you, when you think about Jesus, who came uh, to save his people from their sins, have you been saved from your sins? We have churches today that, that present Jesus to the people as, as the, the one who will uh, save you from a bad marriage. He's the one who will save you from a dead-end job. He's the one who will uh, save you from this sickness or that sickness or this bad situation or that bad situation. Listen, Jesus helps in all areas of life, but he came to save you from your sins, not from a bad marriage, not from a dead-end job, not from the measles. He came to save you from your sins. And if you are going to be saved, you have to recognize that you are a sinner who is guilty before God, who deserves to be separated from God forever, because when you understand you're a sinner, then you cry out, for a Savior. You know, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, sin. Talking to children about Jesus. You know, you, little kids, you got to be careful, mom and dad, about little kids because they can say, well, I, I want to be baptized and I, I want to come down front and I want to uh, talk to the pastor and I want to do this and I want to do that. And uh, a parent doesn't want to be, you put the kibosh on that. If the Lord is working, you want, uh, you want to be, yes, that's, that's good. But you got to be careful, and you have to ask the question about sin. Because no one can be saved until they understand, I am sick with this thing called sin. And there's nothing I can do to remedy that situation in and of myself. As the song says, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only he can wash away our sins. And he did that when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I like the song Rock of Ages. And in the lyrics of Rock of Ages, we read these words, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to thy fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. God is with us 
so God could be for us, so he could pay the price for us, so that we could be saved. Emmanuel, that means God has addressed our greatest fear. It means God has addressed our greatest need. And thirdly and finally, it means God has addressed our greatest blessing. Our greatest blessing. You say, well, what's the greatest blessing? I mean, the greatest blessing is is God is with us to uh, address our greatest fear. That would be the greatest blessing. No, that's a great blessing. That's not our greatest blessing. You say, well, then it would be point number two, that God has addressed our greatest need. That's our greatest blessing, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures that is raised on the third day, according to the Scripture. That's the greatest blessing. That is a great, great blessing. That's not the greatest blessing. You say, well, what's the greatest blessing? The greatest blessing is that the God who is with you, the God who is for you, wants to be the God who lives in you. That's the greatest blessing at all of all, that God would come to live inside of us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 in the Good News Bible says this, and the secret, the mystery, is that Christ is in you, which means that you will share in the glory of God. Can you imagine that God The great eternal God, heaven, not even the highest heavens can contain God, yet he would come to live inside a man, a woman, a boy, or girl who was a sinner, but a sinner who recognized I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, and I put my faith and trust in the Savior, and what happens? Then the God of the universe comes to live inside. See, every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within. That is the greatest of all that God would live inside of you and me. Ephesians 1 says this, in him, in Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you hear it, you're convicted, and then you believe you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Years ago, I preached uh, on that passage. I called it the evolution of salvation. What is the evolution of salvation? In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, you hear the truth, the gospel of your, uh, gospel of your salvation, having also believed. You hear it. You're convicted over your sin. You believe. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. Then what happens? You're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. God, uh, the Lord Jesus, comes into your life through the person of the Holy Spirit, and he comes in to live inside of you, and you're sealed in him. Now, what that really means to those, those people in that day was they knew about a Roman seal. When you put a seal on something, that was Rome saying, this is our authority. You know, they put a seal on the tomb, and that said to the whole world, you don't mess with this. You don't try and roll this stone away. You mess with this, you mess with Rome, and we will come and we will kill you. That's a seal of authority. Well, the Lord says, I put my seal on you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And God says, nobody messes with that. Now, that's what it meant when they wrote that. Here's a good way to think about it in our day and age. All of us have probably, no doubt, in our houses somewhere in the kitchen, a Ziploc bag. You, you, you know, you use a Ziploc bag and it, what does it do? It seals, seals in freshness. It seals, if you have liquid in a bag and you Ziploc it, you can turn it upside down, or at least you can on the television commercials, and you shake it and nothing comes out because it is sealed. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, Jesus comes into your heart through the person of the Holy Spirit, and you're sealed, and he's not coming out of there. Listen, Ron Dunn, the preacher of yesteryear, used to say, my heart is not a hotel with checkout time at 12 noon. When the Lord comes in, he comes in forever, forever, and you're sealed with uh, with the Holy Spirit of promise, and it says that he's given as a pledge of our inheritance. A pledge, the Greek word is erebon, it, it means earnest money. It's like an earnest money contract. You know, if you go to buy a house and you want to have that house and you want them to make sure that's your house, you, you put in some earnest money. 
And if you put uh, $1,000 down, that's like, well, that's not a whole lot of earnest money. But if you put $100,000 down, uh, that's, a big, that's big earnest money. And that says, if I renege on this, you can keep that money. God has given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us himself. We're partakers of the divine nature. And he says, if I were to renege on my promise to take you to heaven, I would lose my Holy Spirit. Well, that isn't going to happen. So the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. See, we are saved. We have been saved. That's justification. That's the moment you receive Christ. He comes in your life. You're saved. You're being saved. You're in the process of being saved. That's called sanctification where the Lord is working on you, and that happens inside in your mind, will, and emotions. Your justification happens immediately in your spirit. Sanctification happens progressively in your soul, in your mind, will, and emotions. And then one day, God is going to save you. He's going to save your body and give you a brand new body. And we know that that is going to happen with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within, sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, it gets even better, and this is something that many of us don't think about, but here is the reality. Because we have the Holy Spirit living within as those who have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, every Christian becomes the holy of holies. Every Christian, you become the temple of the living God. The holy of holies is inside because the Lord lives inside. Paul said to the Corinthians, Corinthians who were struggling with all sorts of sins, he says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple, is a naos, is the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. I have a picture of the temple. Solomon's temple, or this is Herod's temple, the, the second temple that was built. That's Herod's temple. In Jerusalem, you can go. They have a whole city, first century uh, Jerusalem, what it looked like, and that is the temple. You know, when you talk about the temple, like going into the temple, most of us think in terms of the temple is this huge building. It's not a huge building. As you can see from that picture, the temple itself, the inside square footage is small, very small. The courtyard of the temple, that is big. And that big open area that you see there, that's called the temple. Jesus went to the temple. He would teach in the temple. Where is he going? He's going to those open Gentile courtyard areas. And as you get closer and closer into the facility itself, you go through those, those uh, stone walls, then you're in the court of the women. And then you get closer to the edifice, and you're in the court of the the men, and then you're in the court of the priests. Now, inside the actual room, this is what we see. There are two rooms inside there. There's the holy place, only the priests could go. And then behind the veil, there's the Ark of the Covenant. There's the mercy seat with the angels and their wings, and that's where the Shekinah glory of God was. And they only went by, back there one time a year, the high priest one time a year, and he went with bloodshed, and he went with fear and trepidation. Why? Because you're coming into the presence of God. You don't saunter into the presence of God. You do that, and boom, you can be dead just like that. They knew that. They tied a rope around that guy's waist as he went in, because if he died, nobody was going in to get him. They're like, I'm not going in there. You go in there. I'm not going in there. And so let's tie a rope. We'll pull him out. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened? The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and now there is access to God. And here's the thing. Your body, when you receive Christ, he comes in through the person of the Holy Spirit, and you become the holy of holies. Flee immorality. 
Every other sin a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man, what does he do? He sins against his own body. How do you sin against your own body? Because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Hey, Emmanuel, God with us, God came to be with us so that he could die for us, so that he could come and live inside of us and one day take us to heaven. Now, think about Mary. She gets the news, you're going to have the Christ child. She is pregnant. She conceives by the Holy Spirit. She has the Son of God growing inside her womb. And every time he moves, she is reminded, the Son of God lives inside of me. Every time he moves. Can you imagine the, the, how that just blew her away? That was just the most wonderful. God in human flesh lives inside me. That's true for every Christian. God lives inside of you. And as John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. And there'll be more of Jesus so people see Jesus and not me. We lose sight of how awesome it is to be a child of the king. We, we love to sing Emmanuel, but we don't know and we don't really understand the deeper meanings of that. He came, why? Because he wants to address your deepest fear. He wants to address your deepest need. He wants to give you the greatest blessing of all, that he would live inside of you and so that you would know, lo, he is with me always, even to the end of the age. And he's not come alongside of me. He lives inside of me. And he changes me from the inside out. Listen, lots of people have religion. What is religion? Religion is you gritting your teeth and trying so hard. And, oh, I'm going to do this thing called Christianity. I'm going to clean the outside of the cup and of the dish. And it's a waste of time. Christianity is when you understand, I can't do this. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? I can't do this. Woe is me, for I am undone. You cry out to God, and he sees you in your sin and in your repentance and in your faith, and he comes, and he comes inside of you, and he sets up shop in you, and he changes you from the inside out. That's Christianity. That's what people desperately need. I don't know where you are today, but I want to tell you, when the angel came to the shepherds and said, Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That is good news of a great joy if you receive it. If you ignore it or if you reject it, you have taken life's greatest opportunity and thrown it in the trash. And you'll miss out on all that could have been for you. But if you'll embrace it, if you'll receive it and embrace it and say, he came for me. Emmanuel wants to have a relationship with me. He is for me. He died for me. He wants to come and live inside of me. Yes, Lord, I want that. I want you to live inside me. I want you to save me. I want to be the person you want me to be. You can be saved today if you've never been saved. You can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit today if you've never done so. It all starts with just saying, Lord, I surrender to you. Take up your throne in me. They came to Bethlehem. There was no room at the inn. Is there room in your heart? The little song says, into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for you. You've just heard the truth from God's Word, and I hope that you know Jesus and have received Him into your heart through repentance and faith, but maybe you've never done that. If so, today's message was for you, and God wants you right now to surrender your heart to Him. Pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost, and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And Lord, right now, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. 
My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org.